so Disha Phil, y'all. Yes, Donnie Walton. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so excited to be here with you today. Why are we here? What are we doing? What are we talking about today? We're here because we love short fiction. Ah, oh, it's magical, isn't it? Yes. And it's a nice cheat for people like me who can't finish novels, honestly. <laughs> going to keep it 100. <laughs> I will say it has been a nice reading cheat for me during the pandemic when my mm. attention span has been the size of like a yeah. little piece of sand and yes. being able to dive fully into a world and come out on the other end in a very satisfying way has been a joy of this past year. Yeah, I, I think for me... I was drawn to short fiction because that was the first form of writing that I was formally taught. I took this um, flash fiction writing workshop at the Pittsburgh Center for the Arts 20 something years ago. I was taking that class, but I thought you had to write a novel in order to be a real writer, right? Mm. I had to, you know, I needed to write the final revival of Opal and Nev to, to be a real writer. And I still haven't finished a novel, but despite that mindset, the short story form just like kept tugging at me as a writer. And one thing is that I could more easily disguise the dissatisfaction I had in my life in short fiction more so mm. than I could. And so I thought of them as these like little stories of discontent. So Okay, y'all. For everyone listening, <laughs> if you don't know who Disha Filia is, I don't know where you've been the past year. <laughs> she is the author of The Secret Lives of Church Ladies, which has won numerous awards. The Penn Faulkner the Story Prize, the LA Times Book Prize, the Art Seidenbaum Award for First Fiction, and was a finalist for the National Book Award. And The Secret Lives of Church Ladies was probably one of the most satisfying books that I read oh, in the you. past year. And, you know, I recognize so much of our shared hometown, Jacksonville, mm -hmm. Florida, in those <laughs> stories from the references to Publix potato salad, to the price of blue crabs, and <laughs> the living in northern cities and missing mm -hmm. <laughs> the weather at home and really hating the snow um, yeah. was something that resonated for me. And your book is being adapted for television by HBO Max, which is super exciting. Congratulations. Thank you. So exciting. I'm really looking forward to that. It's an opportunity to jump back into these stories in, but through a different platform, you know, moving forward in time and back in time, that kind of expansiveness that you don't get, you know, in, in a short story that so that's a, a unique opportunity that I'm excited about. I want to tell people who you are, too. <laughs> So, Donnie Walton, I am so thrilled to be here with you. Donnie is the author of the novel The Final Revival of Opal and Nev, which Publishers Weekly called a spectacular debut in a starred review. The novel has been named one of 2021's most anticipated books by Essence, Vogue, The Oprah Magazine, Elle, The Independent, Lit Hub, Pop Sugar, The Millions, and Hype Bay. Donnie's work as a fiction writer and journalist explores identity, place, and the influence of pop culture. Donnie's a McDowell Fellow, a Ten House Scholar, and a graduate of the Iowa Writers Workshop. She's worked as an executive level editor for magazine and media brands, including Essence, Entertainment Weekly, Getty Images, and Life. And Donnie is my homegirl, a native of Jacksonville, Florida, and she currently lives in Brooklyn. <laughs> and I am just excited to be here talking with you about short stories and Ursa. Me as well. Duval. Have yes. you been out of the way? Anytime I talk to you, we have to do I a little call. Weird. I sound <laughs> weird doing it. So I love it when you do it, though, because you sound cute doing it. Mine sounds weird. Uh. It's so interesting that we talk about short fiction being somewhat quicker to write. I actually find it the opposite, Disha. Like, I struggle so much with writing short fiction. And I think it's because every word choice counts mm. so much. There's so much pressure on every line. And I feel like with novel writing, there's room for a little bit more of riffing, a little bit more... Not everything has to be so perfect, but I really mm -hmm. admire 
the the beauty and the poetry of short fiction and the the efficiency of it 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 gives me the tinglies and yeah <laughs> speaking of the tinglies your short story collection you had quite a journey in getting the secret lives of church ladies published yes I got to this collection as a detour from trying to write a novel, you know, that the form still, you know, stymies me. And my agent said, not, you know, to your point, it, you know, it's not so much that it's short stories are easier, but she, my agent saw me working on short stories successfully. And she said, well, maybe, you know, you could build a collection around this theme of black women, sex and the black church. You can always come back to the novel. And so what a wonderful detour <laughs> this has been. So from the outset, my agent, even as she was encouraging me to write the collection, she's like, they're really hard sales, though. <laughs> you know, people, you know, publishers don't want collections. They want novels. And I've talking to friends of mine who um, had the same experience either with publishers directly or with agents saying, you're an amazing writer, come back. And these stories are great, but come back when you have a novel. Uh. Um, so I'm thankful that I had to have an agent who doesn't think small like that and just really believes in me and my work and is like, even if it was going to be a hard sell, let's do it. You know, so I, I love that she was encouraging in that way. And so I went in feeling like they were kind of low stakes for me with this collection because, you know, my expectations had been managed that it was going to be a hard sell. I did not expect that it would garner me like a big fat book deal if it did get picked up. And I was fully prepared to self publish it, right? I, I think self publishing is is a great way to get your work out there. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to try the traditional route first. And so my agent pitched and she pitched, you know, the, the big names that we all know and love. And it was passed on and pretty quickly. And then she in included on that pitch list was West Virginia University Press. And the year, maybe some months before we were ready to pitch because I hadn't yet gotten three stories sold. That was the other thing my agent said that make it, made it sound very doable. She liked the stories that I was writing. She saw this theme emerging and she said, if you can publish three of these stories, we can go to market on the strength of three published stories and, you know, pitch a partial manuscript. That felt more doable than finish this novel that I had started a decade ago, you know? Right. Um, so I had, and you know, I'm, I'm like a Girl Scout, like give me homework. So that was homework. So <laughs> while I was working on getting those three stories sold, she had met the director of West Virginia University Press through some networking of her own and mentioned the premise of the collection. And even then, Derek Krisoff was excited about it. So when it came time to actually pitch, he expressed interest and their offer was the only offer I received on my collection. Disha, that's unbelievable. <laughs> and, and it's not because, you know, something... It's not, I mean, it's a different book than the, the the book that came out is is not the book I turned in, but it wasn't like massive editing such that, you know, there was a lot of work that I had to do or anything like that because it's a university press. The I had two peer reviews and they were very positive. There were some things that needed to be tweaked and clarified. I had a phenomenal editor, but structurally, the collection, what you see now is pretty much what we sent out, but nobody was feeling it. Wow. To think that, you know, it was a possibility that your book would not have been in the world. I mean, of course you would have self-published, but still mm -hmm. I have to think about all the voices that are out mm -hmm. there, you know, yes. and especially voices from Black folks, Brown folks, all kinds of people who have a hard time. We have a hard time with gatekeepers anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then to just discount the form, you know, out of right. hand is something that is, is incredibly frustrating. As a Black reader, reading your stories was so meaningful to me to see a kind of woman, a kind of experience that I had never seen before in fiction. And that's hugely exciting. And, you know, I think 
Donnie, that that's part of it. I think they're editors and publishers and their tastes and they're looking at the market, but readers like what readers like. And that's been so affirming for me to hear people say, and in fairness, it's not like publishers are the only ones saying that about the form, because a lot of readers preface their feedback to me by saying, I usually don't like short stories, or I've never read a short story collection before, or I, you know, don't like short stories, but um, so there's something to that. But the readers gave it a chance. And, and I think that's, you know, what all of us ever want with our stories, you know, in any form in our writing, give it a chance to instead of sort of the tried and true. I mean, and we know that's how publishing works. They publish what they've, they know has worked before, which doesn't lend itself to being a gateway to new voices and to new forms and to subversion and to, I took this workshop this weekend, disrupting realism and, you know, all of those different things. But when it happens, it's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. And just thinking about all those voices and the lack of venues. I mean, Mm -hmm. of course, there are many literary journals, there's many digital publications that absolutely publish short fiction. But I think that there's definitely space for more focus on underrepresented communities. Mm -hmm. And this is where Ursa comes in. So Ursa is a new podcast and a new company dedicated to celebrating original short fiction from underrepresented voices. So there are many words in there that I'm excited about. One is original. (laughs) I love Mm -hmm. finding new writers. And on that note, what kind of writers are you really excited about these days? (laughs) <laughs> there's so many. That's the thing. Like for an underrepresented form, there's some masterful work. Oh my gosh. You know? And so, I mean, I think our list could be twice as long, but off the top of my head, um, when I thought about this question, of course, Nafisa Thompson Spires, yes. The Heads of the Colored People. Brilliant. I I never read anything like it before. And when I first heard of it, it was an article, in I think in The Guardian, and it was like, you know, black nerds get their stories or something like that. And yes, it is. And so, you know, it's it's a treasure for us black geeks, but it's so smart and unexpected and funny. Oh, so and, funny. You know, just funny. And then it hits you in the heart and then you're laughing at things that maybe you shouldn't be laughing at. And there's satire. And like, you know, I... You combine satire and short stories like I'm in love. One of my favorite short stories of all time is the epistolary story in Heads of the Colored People between the two. Belletrous. Girl. (laughs) Woo. The way they were slinging the credentials like weapons. Like... (laughs) Well, they started off slinging their credentials and then they got straight Duval. They really did. (laughs) It showed the range of us. Yes. So for those who haven't read it, and we highly recommend that you do, it's a series. It's a back and forth letters between two Black mothers. Their daughters are in private school. And it sort of starts off very kind of passive aggressive, kind of polite disagreement. And then it escalates very, like, (laughs) in a very funny way toward the end. And it is just like, I mean, I was gasping and laughing while reading that story. I think I tweeted Nafisa when I was reading it because in the moment because I had to take sides I can't remember which mom I sided with but you know I was like team so-and-so's mom Um, but it really was like nothing I'd read before and I loved what she did taking on that notion so many times we are the only black girl in different spaces and so here you have the only two black girls and instead of them being friends and it being all love these mothers are at odds and I just thought you know it it was wonderful and and especially black mothers I love when they get to be messy and not Mm -hmm. perfect Mm -hmm. you know love that should I continue yes please do Tyrese Coleman's collection, How to Sit, is fantastic on a number of levels, but it's this hybrid. And it's, I think she says something like it's fiction and nonfiction stories. So it's memoir comprised of fiction and nonfiction. And you don't know what's fiction and what's nonfiction, which is 
fantastic. And she's just a tremendous writer. Yeah. And it's a slim little addition but I love those that are like it's little but it like packs yes. a, a, a wallop yes. it's like an emotional wallop and Tyree deals with mothers and daughters as well and uh, so I find a lot to relate to in, in her stories and I just have to say I had the pleasure of meeting both Nafisa and Tyrese at Ten House and um, mm-hmm. Heads of the Colored People wasn't out yet and I don't think How to Sit was out quite yet either and so to get to um, commune with them, uh, you know, before, like, just before those those collections came out was so amazing. And they're, they're wonderful writers. Love them both. Yeah. And then satire again. I, uh, I love satire. Rian Amakar Scott, The World Doesn't Require mm-hmm. You. So it's a collection of short stories and then this amazing novella at the end. Have you read this? I have not read that one yet, but it's been on my list for a while. So I would even say read the novella first. It might be my favorite part. It's last, but it's this brilliant, again, he, you know, there's playing with form. It's Hermit Crab story Mm. in that you've got emails, you've got traditional narrative and you've got college syllabus. Oh, I love that. You know, I love that. <laughs> oh, so th- I, I will give just a little teaser, which is that the one of the professors is teaching a class called Studies in Loneliness. Mm-hmm. So it's it's fantastic satire. But the um, the rest of the stories, and this ties to his previous book, he this imagined city in Maryland called Cross River. And he's created a whole origin story and things that happen in Cross River. You know, all the stories take place in Cross River. It's just brilliant satire about this imaginary place um, where black people live. Oh, wow. And then probably the collection that made me fall in love with short stories was ZZ Packers. Mm, Drinking coffee coffee elsewhere. elsewhere. Yes, (sighs) ma'am. There are whole scenes from that book that I can can picture to this day. (sighs) Ah. Yeah, very, very The Girl satisfying. Scout story is the one that I immediately think of. Mine is the, what was the, that was the Deacon one where the Deacon is being inappropriate. Yeah. With her. That's a difference. That's not the I Girl I think Scout that's story, a different one. It? Yeah. But it's yeah. just jam. It's just like all hits. <laughs> that, mm-hmm. that, that right. Book. It was like the, you know, what, who has an album that has no misses? That's like ZZ's <laughs> collection. Not a single it's like the B-sides are A-sides, yes, you know. Exactly. <laughs> so. And then, you know, we got to go to our foremothers, our literary foremothers, like J. California Cooper mm-hmm. and her collections of stories. And that's one of the greatest compliments I've ever gotten on um, my collection. People have likened the stories to hers. And Yona Harvey, in reviewing the book, said that these are the stories that Black women told over the backyard fence and that the granddaughters of J. California Cooper, you know, need these stories. And I was like, that's it. I don't care what anybody else says about my book. That's, Uh. you know, that was high, high praise. And she was a devout Christian. And so she was dealing with similar themes that I deal with, but in a different way, because, you know, she wasn't going to be writing about two women having sex in, in in a celebratory way so you know she was very devout her religion was very important to her um so she didn't we aren't coming at these stories the same way or these themes in the same way but that knowing like she had this deep knowing of black women and love for black women and you can see that in the stories and that intimacy beautiful is just unmatched i think and then the last one on my list um blueprint like Gloria Naylor's The Women of Brewster Place, which is a novel, but it's actually divided into seven connected stories. So technically, you could say um, it is a short story collection. But again, that celebration of black women and, you know, inhabiting their own world. Yes. And that's what I was trying to do in my collection is this, this is our world. These are the secrets that we say only to ourselves or to each other. And that same kind of intimacy and and insular world insular in a good way that's what I recall from having read this book even as a teenager you know but it's certainly one that you come back to again and again can I tell you can I tell you that I just read that for the first time about three weeks ago the women of which play what'd you think I was blown away by it and I did not know that it was interconnected stories I had no idea I had thought 
all this time that it was a novel. And of course, I remember, you know, when I was a kid watching the the this, yeah. <laughs> the series, the miniseries that had Oprah <laughs> and Lynn Whitfield and mm-hmm. like um I think Robin Givens was in it. It was like everybody was in it. Yeah. Um but I didn't remember certainly the darker moment toward the end of that book and it is just so full and rich. And and to your point, I think lots of books are actually marketed as novels, but they're really story collections. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm thinking of Ayanna Mathis's 12 Tribes of Hattie is actually, yes. for me, a short story collection. Mm-hmm. And Regina Porter's The Travelers, which came out a couple of years ago, also, <laughs> also a story collection, but marketed as novels. So that's a great, great list. And I'm going to add to it a bit. Okay. Um, one of my favorite writers in any form, novel, memoir, short fiction, is Edwidge Danticat. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. For her tender and lush and heartbreaking and beautiful depiction of the Haitian and Haitian American experience. Mm-hmm. Um, her collection, Claire of the Sea Light, I think is probably my favorite. Um, her most recent is Everything Inside. But Claire of the Sea Light does have that connection. It has connection points between some of the stories. And I always find that really, really satisfying. It's satisfying. It yes. really <laughs> is. It is. Dancy Senna is, is a writer. Uh, I think she's based out in California. But she writes mm-hmm. really hilariously about bougie, artsy, (laughs) bohemian, Black folks, biracial folks. She has done that in written about the Brooklyn kind of person. And she's written about the California kind of person. And her collection, You Are Free, is one that I really, really loved. Um, I love to laugh. So there are satirical moments in it, but also like some real emotion in there as well. And I always have loved that mix. You know, I have to talk about Danielle Evans. Absolutely. Um, I mean, how brilliant is she? That, the Office of Historical Corrections, I was on a podcast and we did a whole book club, just myself and the host on the Stacks podcast, just about that collection. We just went story by story and unpacked it. it. There's so much there. Absolutely. And her first one, Before You Suffocate Your Own Fool Self, you know, that is one that I've returned to a few times. Yeah. The opening story of that virgins is is so good and relatable to me as, uh, you know, like summertime with your friends and mm-hmm. like <laughs> getting into some kind of trouble and and all all of those things. And it's been, I admire her so much as a writer. And then she reviewed my book for the Washington Post, which was just Aww. like, I mean, that was the most flattering thing. And and don't tell anybody, but it was my favorite review of the book <laughs> that I read. So I have to shout her out. Yes. Edward P. Jones. I mean. Mm, mm-hmm. That's a fantastic yeah, his collection. For stories that that center place, and mm-hmm. in, in the case of Edward P. Jones, his Washington, D.C., Lost in the City is a wonderful collection. Yes. I've taught a couple of stories out of, out of that book. You know, he's best known for The Known World, um, yeah. which one, I believe it was the Pulitzer, but All Aunt Hagar's Children, I think it was Mm -hmm. called yeah also just really really brilliant um world building just incredible incredible and then in terms of like new voices christopher gonzalez um Mm. is the Mm -hmm. fiction editor of barrel house and you know i i read a piece of his this is the only story of his that i've read but he has a collection called I'm Not Hungry, But I Could Eat. Okay, that <laughs> cover is, is amazing. It's Did so you, have good. you seen it? <laughs> I have seen it. It's so good. And that that title, the humor in that title, mm-hmm. really gets at something that I love to read. Um, and um, he, the, the piece that I read of his, I think it was on Catapult. I love talking about pop culture. I love writing mm-hmm. about pop, pop culture and its influence on us as people. And he wrote a short story about The Bachelor, <laughs> which I was Oh, like, I have to check out because Chris is hilarious. He's I so funny. Chris on, 
Twitter. So I got to check that one out. Oh, my gosh. Yes. And we have to shout out our fellow Jacksonville uh, yes. writer. Yeah. Do you want to do the honors? Dan Teal W. Moniz. She said the W is there for a reason. So yes. we can say the W. Yes. <laughs> and our Baby D's collection Baby D. is Milk, Blood, Heat. What a great title. So great. Um, I, I read the first story, which I believe is the title story. And I remember reading that in the bathtub and I put the book down and I texted her and I was like, whoa. Yeah. That's all I could just say. It was like, whoa, I yeah. was not ready. Yeah. Not ready for that story at all. And then the collection as a whole is just beautiful. And, and of course, you know, the, I love the Jacksonville in it. But these sort of meditations on girlhood and, and black womanhood and something that Dantiel says often in interviews, like there's more than one way to be black. Mm-hmm. And she explores all of them. But then there's some really wonderful takes on relationships when they've kind of run their course <laughs> right. um, and sort of the messiness of them. And, and she just does that so beautifully. Yeah. On a craft level, it's just spectacular. And mm-hmm. again, I, I also remember reading that first story and the very first line, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of first lines in fiction mm-hmm. um, and it just comes at you with a pow. I won't say what it is, but it involves <laughs> a knife. <laughs> and two best friends. Mm-hmm. And it's just the way she so carefully chooses each word. There's such violence in the line, but it's also very sort of stated in a nonchalant way that just immediately sets the tone for the story. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. We are just beginning to dig into what's happening in short fiction right now, and we are so excited to make Ursa a place where we can celebrate writers and stories we think you ought to know about, and where you can read and listen to that beautiful storytelling for yourself. Yes, so here's how Ursa is going to work. Every other week during season one, we're going to bring you new episodes. We'll have author interviews, book club discussions, conversations about the craft of storytelling and the business of publishing, and also audio stories from some amazing writers. You'll get the first one in your podcast feed very soon. But we can't do any of this without your support. We've created the Ursa membership to help fund our show and build a new home for short fiction. You can join us by becoming a paid subscriber in Apple Podcasts or by going to ursastory.com slash join. In addition to supporting the show, you'll also get access to exclusive bonus episodes for members. We're looking forward to it. Thanks again, and we'll see you soon.